All right, hello and welcome. We're going to be talking about functions, variables, and parameters. And uh, functions is really the broadest category of this top uh, talk. We're going to have invertibility, um, composition. There's domain and range, um, and, and a few other things that I don't quite remember all to off the top of my head. So let's go ahead and knock out variables and parameters really quickly. So first off, we are trained to be scientists. And so we're going to want to study systems, whatever that means. And I'm, I'm intentionally trying to keep this kind of vague. So I'm just going to call a system a collection of elements. And I don't mean elements in the chemistry sense. That's why I'm just going to put it in quotes. I When I say elements, I'm kind of referring to two different things. So there's variables, which typically change, and they're quantities we're observing and measuring. And then there's parameters, which are things that we control, but we set to be fixed. So a parameter is different than a constant. A constant is something like pi. Uh, nature has set constants for us. We can't really change them. Whereas parameters are things that we can control and we fix them. And then variables are the things that we're measuring and expect to change. Okay, so let's look at something that has all three of these ingredients. So let's look at the ideal gas law, Pivnert. All right, so hopefully all of you have seen uh, the ideal gas law at some point in time, uh, or you're seeing it in your near future because maybe you're in an intro to chemistry course. But uh, P is the pressure, and V is the volume. N is the amount of substance, which is kind of vague. Um, you can think of it as moles of substance. I think there's a conversion that takes place. It's been years since I've had chemistry. So anyway, it's an amount of substance. R, this is a constant given to us by nature. And T is temperature. Okay, so I didn't want to write all this out, but those are all the main ingredients. And uh, let's think of some kind of experiment that could take place. So for example, if I had some kind of uh, very sturdy metal cylinder, and the bottom of my cylinder is actually going to be um, part of a hydraulic press. So I have a hydraulic press here, and I can move that bottom up or down. And maybe I put some kind of gas in my cylinder. Maybe it's helium. And up on top is a pressure gauge. Let's try this again. Pressure gauge. And whatever. Here's some arrow. Here's pressure. Okay. And as I move up my hydraulic press, well, then the volume is going to decrease. Decreases. Okay. So volume would be an example of a variable that I can control and change. And it's something that I'm measuring, even though I, I'm, I'm setting it, I'm changing it, so it's a variable. Okay, but maybe I don't want the temperature to change. So maybe I have to submerge this in some kind of bath. Uh, water is a great way to control temperature. Um, but you, you want it in some kind of isothermic solution. So we can set T in this example to be a parameter. The temperature is not going to change, even though I'm going to change the volume a little bit. Okay, another thing that's a parameter would be how much gas I put in this tank. I don't want my tank to have any leaks. So I put in the amount of gas that I want, and then I leave it alone, and it's fixed. Okay, but my volume is going to be a variable, and my pressure is going to be a variable. It just so happens in this setting, my volume is the independent independent variable. It's the one I have control over. And my pressure is going to be my dependent, uh, which I might be misspelling any and all words on here. So little uh, disclaimer there. Um, so I'm measuring how my dependent, my pressure, depends on my independent volume. And I can solve mathematically for pressure. So pressure is equal to nert over v. Okay, so nrt over v. And all of the numerator is fixed. r is a constant, n and t are parameters, I have fixed it. So what this looks like is some constant over v, and I know what the shape of that graph looks like. It looks 
something like this, okay? And as I change, if I use different temperatures and different amounts of gas, I might get slightly different curves, but they're all gonna have the same, oops, they're all gonna have the same shape. And that shape is dictated, so C changes what curve I'm looking at, but it's dictated by this one over V or one over X type of shape or graph. So uh, I love this example because it just shows how context is key, right? I could set up <laughs> a different experiment where maybe I choose to vary temperature, but I keep volume fixed. And if I do that, right, in fact, uh, mathematically, I know what I should expect. So now if I keep volume fixed and temperature is the thing that changes, then, uh, oh, and I'm going to measure pressure again, then, well, this looks like uh, the equation of a line, like mx plus b or mt plus b. In this case, my b is zero. It's, it's not there. I just have some slope, and that slope is given by uh, the volume I choose and the amount of uh, substance that I put in this container. It's the slope is determined by essentially, I'm going to think of this as one parameter, but really I have to fix a few things, right? I have to fix that N and that V. Okay. So what would this look like? It looks like uh, different possible lines coming out of the origin. How do I know they come out of the origin? Well, because the Y intercept was zero. So um, the parameters might change the slope, but down here I have temperature and then pressure. And I should have labeled my axes over here. I have volume and I have pressure. So context can be key for understanding what is a parameter versus what is a variable. Variables are things that are changing and parameters are things that we fix. And all of these are totally different than constants, which are just kind of given to us by nature. And um, we're not going to lump in with this. Okay, so those are variables and parameters. Let's spend more time talking about uh, functions, which really appear when variables start to be related to one another. And to some extent, we've all seen functions before, and I just, you know, very casually just use functions here and here. So we have some background intuition with this, but just to get some formalities out of the way, um, we care about single variable functions. So, okay, often variables are related. And so um, two or more, and we're really going to focus on the two case, variables are related in some way. Okay, so um, some typical cheesy examples would be um, if I have a class and I just number my students, so uh, student, uh, so that I have student one and I have student two and I have student three and so on and so on and so on. Maybe I have 10 students. Then I can take the height of each student and let's say the shortest student is five feet tall and the tallest student is six foot two, maybe. And so each student has some kind of height associated with them and so on and so on. And there we have it. Okay, so my two variables in this case uh, would be which student I'm talking about and their height. And there's a relationship. And, okay, I was lazy, so I numbered my students, but you can think of these students as having names. So there's Sam, and there's Jane, and there's Alice, and so on, right? Okay, so variables, they can be things like names, they can be numbers, uh that we give meaning to, such as height, right? So five feet. Um, and a relation may or may not be a function. So um, you have likely heard of something called a vertical line test. And in this case, we have a function because each input, i.e. in this case, a student, has exactly one height related to them. Related, you can think of it as paired to them. 
it's their height. That's it. They only have one height. You can't have two heights. Um, you could do something a little silly. You could measure each student uh, twice, maybe with and without shoes. Or maybe uh, you measure them a couple times, and each time you get slightly different heights because you're moving around a bit. This is how science actually typically does it, and then we take an average, and then we pin down one point. But in any case, if you're pinning down one output for each input, uh, oh, sorry, height, that's my output. If you get one output for each input, that's a function. And using the same variables, you might not have a function if you just switch who you think of as input and who you think of as output. So if my input is now height, and my output is telling me which student has that height. Maybe, for example, I have a lot of students who are five foot ten. Okay, maybe student, uh, let's say this is student five and student six. They both have the same height, so they're both five foot ten. And then, uh, what did I have over here? You know, uh, Sam, student one, uh, she's or he's or they's are maybe five three. Um, so, uh, Let's see, height, let's say here's 5'3". Okay, here's here's student 1. And I can go on and, and just place dots for, if you give me a height, I can tell you which student or students had that height. So um, this is not consistent. I should have put the dot up here if I wanted to be. Uh, sorry, uh, what's happening here? Here's student 10. Here's student 10. And they need to have the same um, pairing. So in other words, the height of the student doesn't change. It's just what I'm thinking of as input output. If, if student 10 has height six foot two, then that had better be the case in both graphs, whether I think of my input as telling me which student I'm looking at and my output as their height. So this would be 10 comma six two. Or if I think of my input as height. So 6, 2, and my output is telling me which student it is, student 10. That pair had better be the same. And this is why I'm saying, uh, depending on how I think of it, you may or may not get a function. So if I think of height as my input, I might fail the vertical line test because there might be more than one student with the same height. So in this case, um, each input, or let's just say it like this, there exists their exists <laughs> oh one day i'm just going to write better there exists inputs with more than one output so this is not a function Whereas the graph on the left, this is a function. Okay, same variables, but it's just who's my input and who's my output. All right, so in science, we often get things, this is just a, an aside to the real world, okay, aside to real world. As far as this weird um, issue with function and not function, okay? Um, so, okay, saturated fat raises cholesterol levels. And uh, every once in a while, there's an article that's released in like Time Magazine or wherever that says, oh, maybe saturated fat isn't bad for you and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and Every once in a while, you might get someone who says saturated fat doesn't raise cholesterol. And they might point to an article which truthfully has um, a graph of some data like this. So um, my horizontal axis, my input, is going to measure how much saturated fat participants eat. And it's measured as a percentage of calories. Okay. Um, it's rare to find someone who doesn't have any saturated fat in their diet. So maybe down here is not 0%. Maybe we start at 10%. Okay. Or, um, you know, maybe they're a super healthy eater and, and maybe it's even like 2% or something like that. But it's rare to have zero. 
And it's also rare to eat 100% of your calories from fat. You would die. So maybe we stop up here at 40%, okay? And then my, my output, I'm going to measure their cholesterol level. Cholesterol. Which, if I can't spell it, I'll just conveniently have sloppy letters. Okay, so cholesterol. And you have a bunch of participants. Maybe you observe a couple hundred people. And so you start to get some data points. Okay. And it's this really kind of uh, messy looking thing. But we definitely see some kind of trend going on. And in fact, if you were to do a vertical line test, it's plausible that you might get multiple data points on one line. So just plotting your data is often not a function. Okay, I can't go right here at 15% saturated fat and say, aha, you will have exactly this cholesterol. Um, often, I mean, well, we just can't do that. And it turns out that's because of genetics. Okay, you can have different people eating the same amount of saturated fat and they will have different cholesterol levels. That's just genetics. And so it turns out if you do a best fit line, you get something that is completely horizontal. And this is telling us there's no relation between uh, saturated fat as, so I'm going to abbreviate that as SF percent. Uh, so saturated fat percent of calories. And, okay, so this was total cholesterol, which I'll just abbreviate as TC. And that's true. But I just said saturated fat raises cholesterol, so what the heck is going on? All right, so this is going to get at something that we're going to look really deep into in calculus, which is we actually might be more interested in how things change rather than what things are. So maybe I'm not interested in total cholesterol, but instead, instead of surveying people and, asking, and, and looking at their saturated fat content in their diet and then measuring their cholesterol, maybe what I want to do is control their diet. And I want to have um, knowledge over what their uh, cholesterol is at different levels of saturated fat. And then what I want to look at is the change in cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol. So we use uh, this triangle or the capital Greek letter delta to mean change. And now, so I still have percent saturated fat. If you're down here around 2%, so whether you have no saturated fat in your diet or 2%, we would expect a, no change in your cholesterol. All right, but by the time you get up to around 33% of your calories coming from saturated fats, we would actually expect to see an increase of about 50 points, uh, or uh, however they measure cholesterol, whatever the units are, in your cholesterol level. And suddenly, if you plot your data, okay, it's still not a function. Oh, I should have started where I could see it. If you plot your data, it's still not a function. It still might fail this vertical line test because different participants might have a slightly different change. But what you get if you take an average or you use a best fit line, you'll get a model. And um, you can think of this as an average of the different participants, or you can think of it as some best fit line, whatever that means. Okay. And now we have a way to model how cholesterol levels will change as you vary saturated fat in your diet. And um, this is why we say saturated fat influences cholesterol and why saturated fat is bad for you. Um, and yet it's still true that if you don't look at the change in cholesterol, if you just measure total cholesterol, you won't pick up this difference. And that has to do with genetics because some people might just walk around, two people on identical diets, one person might walk around with a total cholesterol of 150, while another person might walk around with a total cholesterol of 200, even though they have identical diets. Okay, but let's say on their diets, they're both eating, uh, I'll make it kind of fatty. Let's say it's 20% it's saturated fat. If those two same individuals, you reduce them down to 2% saturated fat, you put them on a very low fat diet, then their change is going to be the same. That's what this graph here is saying. 
So uh, I don't have the model up in front of me, but if everything I have is correct, then 20% is gonna be a little bit closer to this end. So maybe they'll both decrease by something like 30 points. So the 150 will go down to 120 and the 200 will go down to 170, okay? So um, I just think this is an interesting example of how, uh, what are we tying here? If you just plot data, it might not be a function because it might fail the vertical line test. We can still extrapolate functions by doing things that are called best fit lines, or you can just think of it as taking averages in each um, column. Uh, what, what do I mean? If, if you take everyone who's eating 25% uh, saturated fat, and so you might have multiple data points, just average it and you'll get one data point. And if you just plot the averages, uh, that could work. Um, there's other techniques for best fit. Anyway, then we can build something that passes the vertical line test, and we can model what we expect to see. And if you model total cholesterol, you don't really pick up anything in the population, but if you model the way cholesterol changes, you can indeed see this trend where saturated fat increases cholesterol. Okay, so um, that's what's going on in biology, for example. Uh, the classic math example of something that is a relation but not a function. Let's consider... Um, you can get these little airplanes that hang on a string off your ceiling. And here's my little airplane. And uh, it has a little propeller. And it'll fly around in a circle hanging off the string on my ceiling. And so if I look up from the floor, then I can see this airplane's path as it flies around. It's just flying around in a circle. And I can put a little X, Y grid on this path. And maybe, maybe this is a pretty long string. And so up here is like one meter in the Y direction. And now here's one meter in the X direction. In other words, this circle has a radius of one meter. Well, now there's absolutely a relationship between the X and the Y coordinate because I can't just use any X, Y coordinate if I want to stay in this airplane's path. It has to lie on this path, which means it lies on this circle. So um, this point here, no good. Well, if I want to lie on this circle, that means x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. Or I could write 1 squared. Um, the, <laughs> uh, in general, we'll have the radius squared here, but um, that's not the main topic. So there is a relationship between x and y. Here it is. It's not a function because it would fail the vertical line test. If you specify one input, one x value, there are two possible y values that are in this path when you have that x value. So it's not a function, but there are there's definitely a relationship between these variables. Okay, so functions pass the vertical line test, and uh, it's when you get one output for each input. All right, uh, function uses. This is by no means a complete list, but um, just, I think, some common things that you see in the sciences, and especially in biology uh, or chemistry. So um, one of the big ones, I think, is quantity comprehension. Comprehension. Okay. Um, often the units that we get from physics and chemistry and so on and so on um, can't, they're, they're not quite as useful as you want them to be as something you can quickly look at and understand. So for example, pH, okay? pH is negative log the molarity of hydrogen ions in concentration. Uh, molarity, okay, so this is measuring how many moles of hydrogen per liter, okay? So if you just have this substance and you have some way of, and maybe you have one liter of substance, okay, or something like that, and you have a way of measuring how many moles of hydrogen ions there are in it, then maybe what you find out is that the molarity of hydrogen ions for your substance is 5.3 times 10 to the minus 2, okay? And just taking a glance at that number, it might be a little tricky to know the pH, but it turns out what this negative log does is it lets you just zoom in on this 2, and now I can say, oh, the pH is about 2, okay? And as a quick recap, uh, pH scale goes from 1 to 14, where seven is neutral, and over here we have acids, and over here we have bases. So um, this substance is really acidic. 
And it's a logarithmic scale, so if you had something else that was whatever number times 10 to the minus 3, well, then you'd have a pH of about 3, which means that you are 10 times less acidic. So these are just huge jumps. They're all orders of magnitude. And often when you're jumping by orders of magnitude, that's really hard for the human brain to comprehend, um, which I will try to avoid the rant on wealth inequality. But when you jump by orders of magnitude, we often want to use logarithmic scales to even get behind some kind of comprehension. So quantity comprehension. Um, pH is a function of molarity. Input, output. All right. Uh, the probably biggest one that we sometimes don't even think about would be unit conversion, which arguably um, quantity comprehension is just a special case of that. Um, so unit conversion, gosh, this happens all over the place. You could get something like temperature where there's Kelvin, there is degrees Celsius, there's degrees Fahrenheit. Um, ah, there was a student who uh, mentioned stoichiometry on a little survey that I handed out. So um, let's look at a quick little stoichiometry problem. So how many moles of AgCl? So I <laughs> am not a chemist. I can't tell you what elements these are, but here's a molecule that we care about. Are produced, are produced from... 83 grams of AgNO3, um, where we have two other facts that we know. So one fact is, uh, I guess I should just write the number one. One fact is the, the balanced chemical equation that says if you take sodium chloride and whatever this molecule is, they will produce exactly one of the molecules of interest and one, I don't know, I think it's sodium nitrite, nitrate? I don't know. Again, it's been years for me. Okay, and the other fact that we have is that NaCl um, is in excess, is in excess. So we don't have to worry about it as a limiting factor. The 83 grams, oops. Du -du 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 -du. Oh, I'm sorry, I have these two things switched. Just wasn't even paying it. All right. Wasn't paying attention to what I wrote. Okay, so the 83 grams of this is really the limiting factor. And we're curious how many grams of this substance are produced. Okay, well, <laughs> once all the dust settles at the end of the day, we're just converting units. We're converting grams of the first substance to moles of the second substance. Okay, so in order to do this, uh, you have to find the molar mass of... Um, oh gosh, okay, how should I do this? Let's color code it. All right, so here's my input. Well, I, I guess really, here's my input, the big box. It's grams of AgNO3. Okay, so I have 83 grams of AgNO3 as my input. And in order to answer this question, I need to find the molar mass of AgNO3. And it turns out that if you give me one mole of... AgNO3, it will weigh, uh, where do I have it? I have it right here, 169.88 grams of AgNO3, okay? So um, equals means equals, and when I have an equal sign with two different types of units going on, that means there's a unit conversion at play. So both of these are trying to tell us how much mass there is of this molecule. And in one version, we weigh it, and in the other version, we count the atoms. Okay, so uh, what do I want to do? Well, I want to convert these grams to moles. So, all right, let's see. How can I do that? If I, if I get one mole for every 169.88 grams... The wonderful thing about units is that they cancel the way numbers do. Um, so in this case, the grams cancel. And my final answer will have moles. 
And in this case, if I divide 83 by 169.88, um, I need to get rid of this equal sign because at this point I'm just going to start approximating things. It's about 0.489 moles of AgCl. Um, this was also of AgCl. Okay, and now to finally answer my question, I have to go back to this equation and look at the coefficients. And there's a 1 here and a 1 here and a 1 here and a 1 here, which we've just never written. And so it turns out however many moles of your starting substance, oh, I did it again, I did it again. I keep writing the Cl when I mean to write the NO3. However many moles of your starting substance, you'll get the same amount of your ending substance because they have the same uh, ratio or coefficients. So my final answer, it turns out, is going to be 0.489 moles of Ag, and this time I do mean Cl. Okay, But to do this, it's really just changing units. Um, and even if there was a different coefficient in front of the thing of interest, uh, it would still just be another example of unit conversion. Um, but anyway, I've taken enough time of that. So uh, here's a function, uh, let me wrap this up really quick, where my input is, I already labeled it, but it's grams of AgNO3. And then my, so this is input, and my output is moles of AgCl. And I could write this function down with an equation. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to do that. So um, let me write this as m is a function of g. The, the final moles is a function of the grams. And what do I do? I take the grams that I'm given, such as in this case, and I multiply it by 1 over 169.88. Okay, this is the function at play here to answer this question. And being able to jump from the physical world problem to a mathematical function, that's something that I call mathematizing. Mathematizing. And it's honestly a very tricky skill, and it's an unnecessary skill. We can answer this problem without being able to jump to that function. The point that I'm trying to make is that we use functions all the time, whether or not we realize it. And anytime you are given an input and you're able to compute, one well-defined output, you are doing a function. You're, you're, you're doing something that is a function. Okay, what else do I have? All right, so let's just add to the unit conversion um, column now that I've done this whole rant uh, of a special case of stoichiometry. So there's distance. In America, we use miles inches, feet, and so on and so on. And elsewhere in the sane world, they just use meters, and then you slap on a kilo or a centi, you get it. So uh, maybe I want to convert between miles and kilometers. Okay. Uh, another common un unit conversion uh, has to do with time. We will often have to convert between seconds and minutes, or minutes and hours, and since I can make this first jump, and I can make this second jump, there's no reason I also couldn't convert between seconds and hours. And this is something that we all know, but just very rarely done. Okay, so these are all examples of functions in real life. Let's talk about ways we can display functions. So displaying functions. And actually, this is getting pretty long, so I'm going to end the video here, and we'll pick it up on the next one.